Hello again. Welcome to our sixth midweek magazine programme, the Telusk Forum, for everyone in the Usk Valley. I'm Julian Stedman, a lay minister in the local churches, and we've got a lot of material in our programme today. Yesterday morning, Alison interviewed Jill, one of the older members of the St Ed's congregation, who's been experiencing an unusual form of lockdown. Vaughan will play us some bark, and in contrast to her earlier interview, Alison has also met up with the Calm Boys, who talk about their lockdown experiences, particularly its impact on their education. And finally, Jeremy will talk to us about Jesus' teaching about the temple. Before we continue with these items, I've been talking to Barry about how we can introduce some home group meetings for those who'd like to meet up. We've been looking at the Talking Jesus course. Yeah. Well, hi Barry, it's really good to have you with us this morning. Um, and you know a little bit about this course, perhaps you'd like to just explain something about it, thank you. Yeah, well, I was drawn to it by the fact that it's by Dr. Rachel Wolf, who has actually been to Krakow. She ran a Fresh Expressions conference a few years ago here, which uh, we drew uh, quite a crowd to, and it seemed to be quite encouraging. Fresh expressions are things like messy church, and some churches have youth church, all forms of, uh, of outreach, really. She's a friend of the family, and uh, so I watched this course when it first came out and thought, that's really challenging. She was, um, I think, originally appointed by uh, Rowan Williams when he was the... Um, Archbishop of Canterbury. So who, who do you think the course would be suitable for then, Barry? Well, in a way, all of us. Um, I don't know what, uh, what your first car was, whether it was like mine, a Morris, or an Austin, or a Triumph. They don't really exist anymore, do they? And uh, someone said there's nothing automatic about the survival of the church. If a car manufacturer stops making cars, the firm goes out of business. If the church ceases to be making Christians, it disappears. Uh, we remember Jesus' first uh, challenge to his disciples, I will make you fishers of men, and his last one, go and make disciples. So I think we really need encouragement today uh, in doing just that. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Barry. Um, I've got a trailer of the course, and we're just going to have a, a quick look at that, and then we can talk about the practical arrangements for meeting together. So I'm just going to try sharing the screen, and we'll see if we can have a look at the course uh, information together. So one of the last things that Jesus said when he was here on the earth was, go and make disciples of everyone. We're going to be getting inspired to share our faith with those around us, get some practical tips on how to do it, and look at what it is we're exactly sharing. This is for people like you and me. We're already the right people in the right place. We're ideal to do mission in normal, everyday life. You got anyone coming? How about your mates? Ah, oh, trust me, it's not their thing. They're the last people in the world who want to come. Ask them. I find when I talk about Jesus, I feel like I'm involved in something really weighty, you know, something that really matters. I find that generally people are very open about things of God, and actually they do want to talk about it. You know, if a friend tells you somewhere's really good, uh, or a family member does, then you're going to want to check it out. The best recommendation for Jesus is not somebody distant, it's not someone out there. It's, it's your friend, it's your brother. People, by your lifestyle, will see the different way you live. Be your authentic, real self, sharing your experience of what it means to walk with Jesus. And each of us have got stories to tell about how Christ made a difference in our lives. I've got something for you. A gift. We're going to be looking at how to share God's story with those around us. We've been given this responsibility and this privilege of sharing God's love with others. It's just prayer. You can't get it wrong with prayer. Just find the five people you need to pray for, keep praying for them. And as you continue to pray for them, God begins to work in your heart as well. This 
is Talking Jesus, training Christians to share their faith. It looks a really interesting course. But when were you mm. thinking we might meet together to do it? Well, I, I think it would be useful to do a, a pilot group, you know, a trial series as, as soon as possible. But if we can then spread it around, I mean, most of our house groups are closed at the moment and we could, you know, ask them first to form a pilot group as soon as it's practicable, I think. Well, now that you've seen the trailer, please let me know if you'd like to join the group, as it would be helpful to have an idea of numbers. We can also make sure that you get the link to the Zoom meeting. And now we'll carry on with the programme. Hello, Jill. Hello, Alison. Good to see you. And you too. Thank you for agreeing to share your experiences of isolating during the uh, coronavirus crisis. And in your case, it is isolating. So would you like to explain to us your decision about how you were going to deal with this? Yes, because I am 83 and share a home with my son and grandson, the government guidelines were very clear that people over 70 should self-isolate. So I booked into a self-catering small cottage above Tratower from March 21st. The lockdown started two days later, so I was very fortunate. The farmer and his wife um, said I could stay here for as long as I wanted to for a very reduced rent. I became a resident of the cottage as directed by Powers County Council and the farmer and his wife have been wonderful to me. Good. Well, <laughs> you took it literally, so you're obeying all the rules, but you are in a rather remote rural place are there any positive things about where you are? Yes, many positives. As I have cows and sheep for company, there, were a, a, there was a new calf born every day. I never knew that cows could snore, but I'm, I certainly got used to it, and I'm sure they do. And one day, a frisky cow who had just given birth decided to jump over the fence, quite a high one, and come to see me. I was marooned inside my cottage um, for two hours while she decided to, to skip, skip around and keep me in. And then she decided to go home two hours later and left a large calling card. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I've had a wonderful view, still have, um, two birds' nests above the front door, honeybees as well as bumblebees, lots of wildlife to observe, and I'm one of the fortunate ones. It's idyllic and very peaceful, and all the kindness, particularly from church friends, and also for the Zoom and FaceTime which has kept me in contact with the world. Mm, mm. So life is not boring. <laughs> you have no, company, no. If, if not human company. So there are the positives. Have you found anything difficult during this time? Well, the only really difficult thing has been poor reception for my mobile phone. Mm. And really, to guarantee having a link um, to the phone or for the phone to have reception I have to go 150 yards to my car that's oh. the only guarantee that mm. I can have mm. Mm. Um, and also uh, yes I've, I've missed human contact but have been so busy I've never been bored good <laughs> good that's very positive so yes it's what sort of things have helped you to get through this time on your own? You've, you've touched on one or two things, but would you like to... Yes. Um, well, I guess um, things that have helped me um, to get 
through being isolated is that originally get a visit from my son and my grandson mm -hmm. alternate evenings for half an hour outside and they would bring me provisions. Since then, both have developed the virus about three weeks ago, and John Steadman has very kindly done my weekly shop, uh, for which I'm very grateful. My son, Simon, has been really ill with the virus, but is slowly recovering. The doctor has said I should still not go home for two weeks after the symptoms have gone. So I contacted him yesterday, my son, and he still has a headache, which he doesn't normally suffer from, and his temperature spikes up and down. So I've warned the farmer and his wife that they've still got me for another two weeks at least. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do Dominic, age 10, quickly recovered. Mm. And Good. yeah, absolutely. So that's the up to date. Um, so in view of the circumstances and the change in circumstances, was this the right decision for you? And are you looking forward to going home? <laughs> yes, it's certainly been the right decision, particularly as they both developed the virus um, and I could well have caught it. And yes, I am looking forward to going home. Thanks, Alison. And seeing people not just on Zoom, etc., which is great. And it's always lovely but I am looking forward to it yes yeah. <laughs> well when we first heard where you were we were rather concerned for you but you've actually treated it with an open mind and you've been very positive and you're surviving very well and thank you very much for sharing your experience with us thank you M my pleasure thank you for your company lockdown experience that's great I've just been talking to somebody who's 83 and has been in isolation and right. want to hear about your experience because I'm sure it's rather different from that so, yeah. <laughs> so when did lockdown begin for you when did you finish school um, I think we finished school about two to three months ago right. um, and that's pretty much when lockdown began um, I haven't really been outside much, uh, predominantly just staying in, indoors. Right. Um, yeah. So my lockdown experience might be a little bit different to my to my brothers. Right. Uh, yes. So Musa, were you happy when school finished, or were you a bit sad? Uh, I was. I was a bit happy at first to uh, to get a break because I actually finished a week before everyone else. Oh, right. I I thought because I had like a really bad cold so I didn't want to endanger the chance of getting it of giving out COVID but mm. but for me it was it was it was really good at first to get a break but since it's been like three months now it's yeah. just it's the same thing quite a lot so it gets a bit boring after yeah 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 so um you Bob have, uh, have you found it difficult to discipline yourself with schoolwork um uh, to a certain extent, because I've just finished my year 11. So going into um, sixth form, I have certain subjects that I've picked. Mm -hmm. So the work, the work that I'm getting from those subjects is 
work that I enjoy doing. So no, it's not been that hard. Yet. Not bad, right? Okay, because you you've got a full household, and uh, I just wonder how you manage with um, computers and so on. Is it has that been difficult when everybody needs the computers at the same time? Um, no, not really. We 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 manage. You know, have a routine. Who's got their lessons? Uh, they'll have the you know the the laptop or the computer right. at that time. Right. When we saw it. Right, right. So you've been organised. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what what have been the good things about this? I mean, it's a strange situation. Most of us have never been in it before. Have there been any good things, any positive things? Yeah, I mean, um, it's just a surplus amount of time to do, learn other things, do things that you wouldn't have time normally to do. For example, mm -hmm. I've started doing Duolingo and I'm learning a language or trying to anyway wow. so, Great. so it is it is, it is um, allowing me to do other things that i probably wouldn't get to do with school yeah. and stuff uh -huh. yeah is that the same for you musa yeah it, me I've, I've taken a different road i've gone down the road of video games oh, so right. <laughs> right. I'm at, uh, at the xbox <laughs> right right and uh, you're at a bit more serious stage of school work um, school life are you uh, have, yeah. you, uh, have you been uh, nose to the grindstone or have you had some relaxation time? Um, yeah, so when lockdown first began, um, I was a bit nervous about uh, what the exams um, were going to turn out to be or, um, you know, what the procedure was going to be, knowing that school was going to be off for a few months. Yes. Um, and I didn't know what, you know, whether I would have exams, uh, whether the work that I put in all year would go to waste or not. Yes, yes. I was a bit nervous at the start, um, but I think when I started to get more details about what was going to happen, mm. um, I just started focusing on what I need to do in the next year. So right. it's been a lot of reading and watching right. videos. What's next? Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So what what have you each missed most about not being in school? You, Bob. What do what do you miss most? Um, for me personally, I miss playing basketball because obviously yeah. we can't now. but i i also i also miss just being able to hang out with my friends and just go just just do what a normal teenager would do you know? yeah yes yes yeah is, is that the same for you musa yes yeah, same it also not like not being able to talk freely to my friends and not being able to learn stuff in a more interactive way rather than learning through an iPad. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Is that the same for you? Are you? Yeah, especially, yeah, especially with the, the, the last point there. Um, mm. There's a certain kind of um, speciality that you get from a teacher teaching you face to face. Yes. Um, that you just don't, you just can't attain it from, mm. you know, having an iPad or your phone. You have to, yeah. for me specifically, I need a teacher yeah. to really you know, give yeah. me that information. Face to yeah, face. yeah, I understand that. Yeah, yeah. Um, because everything's been disrupted, I'm just thinking about your futures. I mean, obviously, um, two of you, uh, Moose are probably less so, but but you are making decisions for the future. Things haven't gone as planned. Do you think it's going to affect what you do in the future? Do Do you want to say? Um, are you? Uh, yes. Um, so this year was um, a chance for me to, you know, go to open days or, yes. or look at uh, universities that I might, you know, go to in the future. Um, but uh, I think virtual open days um, don't exactly give you that same opportunity. You know, you can't, you can't ask all the questions you want to ask. Um, you can't actually get the full experience of going to the university okay. and seeing what, what, what it's like firsthand. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I think that's a bit, you know, it's a bit difficult, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that's probably the closest. You know, yes, time. yes, yes, I imagine that's been quite strange, yes. You, Bob, is it going to affect your future very much? Um, not, not really, I mean, because I'm going to go to Krakow um, uh, for A-levels anyway, so. Yeah. Right, it, yeah. It, yes. yeah, yeah, fine. So, um, are you longing to go back to school? Is it is it going to be at the end of the month? Are you looking forward yeah. to it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
So for no, we're not. all the you are not. <laughs> it sounds I mean, I'm enjoying I'm enjoying staying at home to be honest. Right, yes, yeah. I think different people have reacted differently, haven't they? Some people love lockdown and uh, yeah. and other people have found it very difficult. I suppose it depends how much you miss other people, doesn't it? And whether you can keep in touch with your friends. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're all still smiling. <laughs> <laughs> it's been great to talk to you. And thank you very much for sharing your experience of this rather strange time. Thank well, you. Yeah. Bye. No. Bye. Bye. Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you, you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body, and when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and they believed the word that he had spoken to them. John 2, verses 18 to 22. Here, Jesus has just driven out of the temple courts, the market. There were in one of the outer courts of the temple lots of people selling livestock, changing money, and I dare say there would have been hawkers of all kinds of things, souvenirs, memorabilia, whatever people were looking for at those places. Zeal for the house had consumed Jesus. He drove them out and he had provoked anger. And having provoked all this anger, they challenged him. They said, what right do you have to do this? By what authority are you doing these things? And then Jesus responds with a somewhat bizarre non sequitur. When challenged about rights and responsibilities, he starts talking about the, this thing something which actually came back to, at his trial later on. At the time it was a bit opaque, not really an obvious response, but with the clear hindsight of vision one can see that what he said was a profound statement about himself, about who he was, about his mission, about his purpose, about what he had accomplished, and therefore it describes exactly his authority and why he would do these things. The temple was the physical dwelling house of God, the physical house of God, the dwelling place of the name. God does not live in a house, it says in scripture many times. And so the temple was not the place where God was thought to live as such, as in the way that people lived or the way that the, the gods of the nations around them lived. It was the place where his presence rested, the place where his presence was universally acknowledged to be found, the one place where he was, as opposed to all others. Scripture is clear that God somehow fills the world and is everywhere present. But this temple was the sign of his presence among his people. It was the sign of the covenant with Moses, the sign of the covenant with Abraham about the land. One holy, solitary, unique temple for the one holy, solitary, unique God. One people, one land, one covenant, one God, one temple. All these things are bound up with the presence, the physical presence of the temple there in Jerusalem. So who built it? Originally, 
Solomon, the son of David, had built it. So when Jesus said he will rebuild it, Jesus described in Isaiah as the Prince of Peace and many, many times as the son of David would be the new Solomon, the new builder of the temple. By saying this though, he somehow implies there is something lacking in the temple which is and that somehow he will supersede Solomon. The temple which he saw had actually been begun under the, the ministry, if you like, of Ezra after the return from exile. And for decades previously, the 46 years described by the, the people around him, it had been beautified and extended and amended, mostly under the, the, the uh, auspices of King Herod, who put a vast amount of money into rebuilding the temple. A colossal amount. By the time of the life of Jesus, it was a fabulous building. Its splendour was extraordinary. It was unique. There was nothing else quite like it throughout all the Roman Empire. Visitors to Jerusalem were amazed by it. Even the Roman um, procurators and legion commanders, the people who had to be there, they'd been maybe to Athens, they'd seen the Parthenon, they'd seen the great temples in, in Rome. Even they were impressed. It was quite something. And in 40 years, from when Jesus said those words, it would be utterly destroyed. Not one stone would le be left standing upon another. The only trace of it now is the platform upon which it was built. But then John mentions that the temple that Jesus was speaking about was his body. Now, this then is a foretelling of Jesus' resurrection. Jesus knew what his purpose and mission were in life. He had said in many ways, somewhat obliquely and some plainly to his disciples, what would happen. He described many times his suffering, his death and his resurrection. And no one knew what to make of it. So when he did rise from the dead, his followers, his friends and his enemies for that matter, were all confounded. Whatever he meant by those things that he had said, and obviously John here recalls what he said at that time, no one expected that. No one expected him physically to come out of his tomb. But what this does immediately prove is that by rising from the dead, Jesus demonstrates to us his authority. His authority to tell us. His authority to correct us. His authority to do those things. It also brings attention back to his body, his own flesh and blood. This says that the one who has this authority, the authority to tell us, the authority to instruct us, the authority to correct us, to rebuke us, to put us right when we are wrong, this authority, which as far as the Israelites were concerned would only come from heaven, resided in a man. A man, moreover, who had risen from the dead. A man whose power and authority, if you like, were greater than death itself. That body, originally born of Mary, would not stay in the tomb. And that body, born of Mary, would carry that authority. But then this too combines two images. It combines the idea of a body and it combines the idea of the temple. Jesus brings these two things together. And so this is where the train of thought comes off. There is more to these words than the simple foretelling and a simple analogy, if you like, of the destruction of the temple. Paul, the apostle, describes the church as the body of Christ. He therefore states that by his rising to life again, in his body, in his fleshly human body, he will bring life to the church, which is his body, which is also his body. The life of the church is completely dependent upon the life of his flesh, which rose from the grave. But the life in the church comes out of the life of the resurrection. 
This body emphasizes his physical nature, that he is the new man, the new Adam, the new king, the incarnate son of God. It brings together the idea of the presence, because if this authority resided in Jesus' body, the presence of the divine resides in that body. The sign of the Lord God among his people resides in that fleshly body. Jesus is the sign of the Lord's covenant with people. The sign of the presence, the divine presence on earth. But now that we are his body, the church, we are the sign of the divine presence on the earth. We are the physical presence of God on the earth. We're the demonstration of his covenant. We are the people of his pasture, the flock of his hand. It says in the epistles, in Paul and in Peter actually, that each one of his people, each one of us who has been renewed and regenerated by being reborn in baptism, has become a living stone being built into a new temple. A temple not built by men, a temple not built by people, by human hands, a temple built by God. Because in each one of us rests the Holy Spirit, the presence of the divine, the sign of the covenant, the sign of God's will upon the earth. And together we form that body of Christ, and together we form the new temple, the new dwelling place of the name, the new sign of the Lord's presence on earth, the new place where his presence rests. And this draws us back to the place of worship. Now the, the temple in Jerusalem was the one place of worship, the focus of all worship for the Israelites, which is why they would make these annual pilgrimages at these times, which is why they would travel to Jerusalem for the great pilgrim feasts, as they call them, the great travelling feasts where the people would gather together in the presence, in the solitary locale of where the Lord's presence rested, in order to be the sign of the gathered people, the sign of his people gathered from the earth. And now we're scattered all over the face of the earth. And so there is no longer one place where the Lord's presence rests, but all the places where his people rest. And so the place where we worship now is not a location. Because the Father said to Jesus, and Jesus said to Nicodemus, the father, sorry, to the, the woman at the well in Samaria, he said, she said to him, why should we go to Jerusalem? You, Jerus you Jews say that we must go to Jerusalem, but our fathers tell us that we must worship here on Mount Gerizim. And Jesus said to her, the time is coming where you'll worship neither in Jerusalem and the subtext there is because the temple will be destroyed, or nor in Mount Gerizim, because it will be irrelevant. Because the Father doesn't seek worshippers who travel to a place, the Father seeks worshippers who will worship him in spirit and in truth, in the Holy Spirit of his presence, and in the truth of his Son Jesus, who is called the truth, who receive the truth of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Thereby do we worship him. And only then can we worship him. Only then are we able to offer acceptable worship to him. And so the worship becomes not a place, but the presence within. It becomes wherever we are. This means that we are the dwelling place of the name. We are the presence of God among his people. We are the sign of the covenant. We are the living stones of the temple. We who have heard his call, we who have responded and been baptised, we who have turned to him in our hearts, we who have been renewed by the Holy Spirit, by the indwelling word, we have become that sign. We have become the presence. And therefore, that authority which Jesus claimed is proven to us by the apostles who saw him rise from the dead. And therefore, that authority once proven by the Apostles, is the proven authority for us to speak these things. And all these things Jesus said 
when the Jews said to him, By what authority do you do these things? Thank you.